Good afternoon and welcome to today's webcast, A Shift to Digital, Will It Cost Jobs or Save the Planet? This webcast is held jointly with the Chartered Banker Institute, Manchester Metropolitan University and ICAEW Northwest. Please note that we are recording today's webcast and it will be available to watch on demand. If you have any questions throughout the session, please feel free to submit these via the Q&A box. We hope you enjoy today's webinar and I will now hand you over to our panel. Thanks so much, Heather. Um, so digital technology, it is an exciting phrase, uh, but also maybe even a daunting one, uh, because technology can obviously be a very transformative force, but it also brings with it lots of change and uncertainty as well. So I'm here with Don and Chris, and together we're your panel, and we're gonna let you know our reflections on the subject and hopefully answer some of your questions as well. So John and Chris, do you want to introduce yourselves? Maybe John first. Uh, yeah, hi everyone, nice to meet you. Uh, I'm John Toon, I'm the technology strategy lead at Beaver and Struthers. So we're a, a mid-size accountancy firm based in the Northwest. Our head office is in Manchester. And uh, my role is, is fairly unique in the accounting space insofar as uh, I'm responsible for our strategy as a firm in terms of how we adopt technology in its widest sense, um, but also uh, in terms of uh, having a client facing role in terms of helping our clients adapt to the digital transformation that's occurring in the in the workspace and in the in the business space at the moment. Hi everyone, I'm Chris Brown. I'm the founder of Brown & Co. Um, I'm also the current president of ICAW Lancashire South Lakeland uh, for my sins. Um, we operate a small practice uh, in the Northwest and uh, we're a fully digital practice, so mainly serving SMEs, some large multi-million pound of businesses. Um, obviously with the, our sort of digital approach, we, we service clients nationally and internationally as well. I've got a call with uh, an Australian client, I think, next week. Um, and we've been a digital practice for quite a number of years. We love all things tech. We, we embrace it fully. Um, and we're always looking for ways to, to improve our, our sort of efficiencies, both in selling and for clients, um, to all, all the sort of latest digital tools and gadgets out there. Wow, that's great. Uh, if I didn't introduce myself, I should say my name's Kate West and I'm a senior lecturer at Manchester Metropolitan University Business School. So I am really looking forward to having a chat with Chris and John about all things digital and how it might affect the world of finance. A shift to digital, will it change jobs or, or save the planet? I guess a good place to start would be just to think about how technology impacts us as finance professionals in our everyday lives. Um, now, obviously, I'm not a practicing finance professional. I'm a, I'm a university lecturer, but technology does affect me a lot. Um, and I think much more so since the COVID-19 pandemic. That really, for me, I think created a shift in my outlook and my willingness to embrace technology. And I'm sure that I'm not kind of alone in that kind of thinking. So obviously, I do a lot of work um, at home. So I use kind of collaboration tools, um, Microsoft Teams, emails, video chats, podcast software. Uh, I make video casts. I use AI to do things like transcriptions. In the classroom, we use collaboration boards and polling tools, and we throw QR codes out daily, you know, four or five times an hour. But I was also thinking that a huge impact for me is actually fighting technology because um, you know we've just kind of come into a world where large language models can suddenly do things like write essays. And uh, that does have a threat to my work around um, threatening the integrity of assessment. So there are some upsides and some downsides for me. And I wonder how you two think that technology impacts your day-to-day -day work as finance professionals. Shall I go first then? Um, yeah. I think for us, it's, it's com I'll say it's completely transformed our way of working to our advantage and to the clients that we work with. Um, I think the key thing for us is, is we've, we've been early adopters, if you like, um, of a lot of technology. And I think that's really been key for us. We've been able to get ahead of the curve with things like MTD, Make It Tax Digital. And obviously, when the pandemic hit, we, we could 
I hate using all these buzz, buzzwords with pivot and sort of um, change our, our sort of business model quite quite quickly to um, to be able to react to things like that. So I think you know not not just sort of in terms of the detail in terms of how we work with clients, but actually as a business, uh, we've been able to to move really quickly at the times and, and and that's helped our growth as well as a business. We've we've, we've been growing year on year between twenty and twenty five percent. The last five years and that's really down to to the digital um, tools we've been able to use and um, we've been able to scale quite quickly and i think that's kind of quite a key thing for a lot of businesses and we we tell our clients this is look it's it's worth for our benefit we you know it's enabled us to grow and scale quickly it can do the same for you and um, so you know we and we always adopt things first trying them out before we tell clients or or you know recommend anything and um, you know we like to experience things ourselves so you know, it's it's affected our day to day lives in terms of what we do, um, but also the nature of the work as well that we do. It's 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 less focused, I think, on processing, more on added value of the buyers, which I know we'll talk about later. So, uh, f from from our point of view, it's it's completely transformed our way of working and, and our clients as well, the ones that have adopted it. You had real foresight there, Chris, to. Um... You know to kind of go that way didn't you yeah ahead think, of the curve i think we, we always you know we always knew technology was was going to be a part of as, as finance professionals um as our role and i think you know we were keen to kind of not just do things for the sake of using nice tech or apps or things and i think that's the that's the um trap lot can fall into it's like just jumping on things because it's fun or it's different or it's new and exciting but we kind of, you know, there always had to kind of be a business reason for doing it. What, you know, what was it going to improve? How was it going to help us? And then we'd adopt things. So, um, you know, when COVID did come in, you know, we did have to change um, quite a few bits of, of kit, but we, you know, we did it ourselves. And we did it fairly quickly. Um, and that pain, that sort of pain that we had initially, we're reaping the benefits of it, of it now. Um, so I think, yeah, I think, you know, having a long term, long term mindset is, is key to all this is not just jumping on things for the sake of it. I think, you know, it's got to form part of your business plan. How about you, John? How does um, the use of technology impact your clients and the services and the value that you can add to them? Um, it has a it has a significant impact. And I mean, yeah, look, technology has been around in business for, for a long, long time. Um, you know, if you take things like spreadsheets that accountants, you know, you know, love and hold dear, you know, spreadsheets are what, 40 years old now, something like that, you know, almost as old as me and, um, you know, essentially replaced, a, you know, an old, very manual way of, of adding up big big lots of rows and columns of, of data which you know had to be done by by individuals and scrubbing out numbers with with you know with rubbers and things like that and then and then updating and correcting again so you know technology has a massive impact and, and i think the biggest challenge for most most you know finance professionals most businesses now is around the, the pace of change with technology you know with the um you know the transformation that chris was talking about you know for him and his practice was mainly driven around the, the sort of the cloud technology revolution that sort of started in the uk um you know around about sort of 12 14 years ago um you know and and from there what we've seen is a greater integration and a wider ability to integrate more and more products. So, you know, we, we've moved from these kind of you um, all in, well, certainly in the, in the accounting space, we've moved from these all in one finance suites that would kind of do everything for everyone that, that did it all fairly averagely uh, to, to now shifting to this kind of best of breed approach, um, you know, where we're able to say, sort of say, right, we want this product here because it is absolutely you know brilliant at doing what it does. And we can, we can really easily pick another really great product over here and we can plug those two data sets together and manage data that that's that's great for some of the smaller firms for for larger firms like us there's still a challenge there for us in terms of um you know we have a legacy of on-prem systems uh you know server-based and, and desktop-based uh, systems that we want to shift to the cloud but we're not quite there in terms of either the vendors in our space 
aren't quite capable of doing that or we're not quite at a, at a, at a point in time where we can shift to new products to do that. So we have challenges around data uh, and data management and data integration for, for a firm. But but in terms of, you know, you, you mentioned the pandemic and, you know, COVID and stuff. And the, the greatest thing that COVID kind of demonstrated, right, was that for any business of any size that you could literally like innovate and change your technology approach within 24 hours you know whenever whenever we went into lockdown was it 23rd of march or whatever it was you know that was the day that anyone who was reticent about using zoom or teams or whatever it might have been uh, you know didn't really have a choice you know 24 hours later because they had to do that and they had to use that kind of technology to to communicate with their with their colleagues with their customers with their clients whatever it was um and um i think it's kind of that that in particular has drawn a line in the sand in terms of you know we can no longer use um, you know, a, a, a lack of compulsion, if you like, to to not adopt technology quickly. Um, yes, there are always going to be challenges around training and and, and timescales and things, but but it shows that it can be done if there's if there's willingness to actually you know just get on and, and do do transformative transformative change. So, are you using um, tech to help you to do things like audit more effectively? Um, as a as a business yeah yeah it- absolutely yeah i mean we um we are an audit firm uh you know actually 60 percent of our business comes from from audit and so we were we were very early adopters of of audit analytics software uh which which before we sort of got into the use of it was was really sort of the prevail of like the, the top four firms who who had their own uh audit analytics teams but were doing it sort of you know uh bespoke if you like so we we've very early adopted that and we've seen that that has been transformative for us uh and it's also now you know expected and required from the regulators and also we're seeing you know clients coming to us sort of saying tell us about your expertise and your experience in using uh you know audit data analytics in in your audit approach and that is now that has now rolled out into uh, you know a wider use of analytics so that that initial phase of using analytics was very much focused on uh, accounting data so you know what you get out of a, a, an account system and the general ledger and now we're moving on to using open banking data in our audit process we're combining open banking data with the the general ledger data and looking for anomalies and doing comparisons and matching there um and and we can take that on a step further in terms of you know we can now start to use things like ai to automatically um uh, pull um data from those systems pull data from things like pdf copies of invoices and we can start to match things in multiple ways so that that has a huge impact for us in terms of um you know efficiency and effectiveness but also you know staying at the very sort of cutting edge of what is expected by the regulator uh to to make sure that we um you know that, that we comply with the the latest expectations and requirements the 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 challenges then around that are um you know, which we'll probably come to a little bit later is is around how we then sort of educate our staff and train our staff to these these changes to approach you know which are happening you know almost overnight in some instances so if you've got those more kind of robust processes, does that help you to reduce business risk? Um, I mean, that's the that's the plan, right? Is if we want to try and reduce <laughs> business risk, or we we want to try and reduce our compliance exposure risk. I guess is, is yeah, probably a yeah. more, more more suitable sort of phrase. Um, and um, that that only happens if you've got the right training in place and the right implementation of these tools. So it's no good just saying we we'll use the data analytics tool and we just switch it on for every client. That that's not good enough. We actually have to do something functional and effective with that and interpret that that data that we're given in, in the appropriate way. Um, but, but yeah, absolutely, it's used to to manage risk. I think John makes an interesting point as well. I think there's there's, there's Obviously, we're a very small firm, but John's from a, a, a larger firm of accountants. But what's interesting about the tech is small small firms of accountants like ourselves can start to compete with bigger firms because obviously we can implement the technology a lot quicker than some of the bigger firms can because of either legacy systems or just a huge volume of data or, or whatever. And once you've done the process, you, you, you're fine, you're on board and going forward is easy, but it's that whole you know process. You've got a lot more people to go through and, and systems and all the rest of it whereas we can just go yeah this is a great bit of kit yeah we're all happy right let's just grab come and do it so i think you know from a, a smaller firm or if you're a sole practitioner or, or a smaller firm actually you've got great advantage because you, we're using some of the same tools not just the, the cloud stuff but some of the sort of advisory kind of tools um which are in the cloud space 
that a lot of the, the bigger national firms of accountancy use. And so in terms of what we deliver, we're actually, we can actually deliver a very similar kind of um, suite of services because we're small and we can, we can react very quickly. Great, power, power to the little people. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I think John kind of alluded to it that there is an impact of increasing use of technology on employees uh, and I guess you know for me on um, the graduates that we send out into the workspace as early career professionals so it's interesting to reflect on that as well isn't it what's the impact of this increase in use of technology on you know those early career professionals and on, on employees generally mm -hmm. Yeah, and and I think you, it's it's a really interesting one, right? Is that we you you get you get this sort of fairly um, well, I find it frustrating sort of generic commentary that sort of says, right, well, if you're employing sort of like Gen Zers or whatever, you know, they're they're expected to come into the workplace and everything's got to be digital because they basically live on their phones and half of them are living in the metaverse nowadays, right? Um, and then and then basically all the all the old old duffers are not going to be. Yeah. to deal with anything because uh, because everything's digital and they're they, old you know, they, they they were they were born and bred you know going to school using like you know uh yeah. you know tablets and, and, a, and a hammer and chisel to do their schoolwork and stuff and, and actually fundamentally that that's that's a bit rubbish um like what we tend to find is like you know, graduates do come to us with certain expectations in terms of technology but it's more around the fact that they just expect it to work right it's not about that they fact that they expect everything to be digital um you know they don't you know we we don't find that many of our graduates come to us and sort of turn their nose up at some of our systems if they're if the ui or the ux isn't isn't great um you know they, what they want to know is they want to know how to use that piece of technology and how to how to do their jobs essentially um the 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 bigger challenge around our pre-existing workforce i guess is around when we're implementing change because there is an education process that's required in terms of you know, uh, quite often when we're implementing technological change we'll be implementing process and system change at the same time so you know it's, it, i think the mistake that a lot of businesses and a lot of a lot of finance businesses make is that what you try to do is you <clears throat> you have a pre-existing process that that may be manual or it may be part computerized and then what you do is you build you build another layer of technology into that and try and keep that process operating in almost exactly the same way. Um, and actually, what you've got to do is you've got to revisit that process entirely and, and then restructure it around the best use of technology and people to get to, to get the maximum efficiency from it. So that that's where we tend to spend a lot of our time is around um, how do we how do we view our current processes? What can we improve? And then what do we need to do in terms of technology implementation and, and training to, to, to match that? And that and that's probably our, our biggest challenge and probably where we spend the most amount of time. Yeah. Um, and I guess doing that might be easier in a smaller company environment because the processes necessarily involve fewer people. It's easier to communicate around them. And maybe it's a more natural leap to use the technology to guide the process rather than try to shoehorn the technology into your process because that's a big company mindset yeah i think so i think i mean we found um you know that, i mean we've got a, a relatively young um workforce so you know i think that sort of goes hand in hand with kind of where we're at using digital tools um and i think we've been able to attract the right kind of people because they've seen us as a, a modern forward-thinking firm which uses these kind of tools i mean i remember i, I um first first started in the county that you know there were some basic sort of it tools out there but we still had to do stuff manually because that was the approach and they were like well you've got to understand how to do this before you can before we let you loose on say a chop or whatever at the time um but our approach is a bit different we kind of um, let people loose on on everything so they can get up to speed you know really quickly um but obviously still handholding in terms of kind of understanding the basics of accounting finance and all the rest of it but i think you know we've been able to attract you know the right kind of people and, and when we talk to others you know it, it's very clear that it i think from a smaller firm and i think the bigger firms it's kind of it's probably less not or not as relevant i think as a smaller firm smaller firm you know, I think there's still this gap between, you know, the archaic firms, which still do stuff traditionally, they're dabbling a little bit in the cloud, but not fully embracing things, or it's done a bit half-heartedly, or the full, we're all in it kind of approach. Um, so I, I think it can definitely attract the right kind of people, but I think I think that's dependent on the sort of size of the firm 
um, as well, which is, you know, which is what John's, John's talking about. Yeah, and what John said about Gen Z really resonated with me because if I've heard once you know, in, a, in a group presentation, the young people really understand technology, but the old people who are over 50 don't. <laughs> and I sit there thinking, oh, hang on, that's me. <laughs> um, and just because you can use your phone doesn't mean that you can use technology. Um, so uh, it always raises a little smile with me. I mean, I think we have to recognize that accounting is a really broad church, isn't it? It's not just um, managing financial transactions. You know, we, it can also be, you know, there's a whole group of other accountants who don't work in the kind of audit space, but work in businesses as kind of management accountants, business advisors. And if we think about the work that we do on a spectrum from reporting, through kind of questioning and then developing solutions and deploying solutions, really that reporting bit is the bit that's getting more automated, isn't it? Getting quicker, faster, easier to do using technology. But that means that in terms of the skills that we think we're preparing our graduates for, it's the more that the questioning, the helping businesses to work to develop solutions and then deploy those solutions in their organization that's the bit that's you know going to be, become more prominent in our roles yeah, absolutely and i think i think you know i think we, we all think that technology is replacing that but it's this has always been the case and i think you know um, particularly in, in, in accounts as accounts having i don't know in the past but you know it, it's seen perhaps as a bit more transactional rather than kind of that supporting role i think i think it's becoming really clear now you know the ones who do that well and the ones who don't so I think the tech has enabled, has, has made that a little bit more apparent. So, you know, we can produce management accounts. We've got, like John was saying, we've got tools, apps that plug into our zero software. We can, you know, produce management accounts within, you know, hours now. You know, they can produce fantastic reports, yeah. all the information and stuff, which yeah. is great. But we don't just ping it across the fight. I mean, the, the important stuff is getting people to, to challenge it and say, well, you know, why is this the case? What's the trend? Where exactly. Are we what can we do? Yeah. To, and that, to really understand the business and, so that they can yeah. kind of give insights and, and that, you know get to the root can, causes and the opportunities and and i think the tech helps you get to that stage quicker so the real added value stuff comes a lot quicker in the process and and that's the key bit you know that's what we're trying to train people to do is it's kind of like yeah don't you know the numbers as long as you understand the output and if it's wrong you understand what to do to correct and why that's wrong as long as you understand that that's fine it's more right let's challenge this and challenge the people who you know um, yeah you know be more challenging inquisitive and, and, and how we, how we so I, I think from, from from my point of view that's a much more interesting job isn't it because I don't think people come into finance and have this idea they didn't come into finance to do transactions processing did they largely they come into finance to understand business and to know how finance works and what drives a business and to speak the language of you know business and finance so it is a more it is hopefully going to be a more interesting job and a more kind of challenging job and that does mean that there are going to be diff different skills and competencies that are needed in order to do that role which are what things like a real deep understanding of the business much better communication understanding just understanding creativity for example data visualization and storytelling mm -hmm. and um getting better at building client relationships um yeah i don't i mean i'd, I'd, I'd absolutely agree with you kate and and i mean you know whenever you talk you know, to to our our teams. You know, we've we've got almost two hundred and fifty staff uh, at Beaver and Shudders. You know, and and the thing that they enjoy most is the interaction with with clients. Right? Uh, it's not it's not sitting at the desk plugging numbers into a spreadsheet or checking documents or um, putting putting numbers into a piece of software or whatever that you know whatever that might be. And that's you know that's my role is to try and get rid of that that drudgery and, and automate as much of that yeah. for them as possible. <clears throat> but the, the the interesting and engaging part of the job is is the interaction that we have with our clients and that doesn't have to be at a at a sort of a, a you know a sort of a super senior kind of role in terms of you're not you're not going to try and help them make a million pounds next week or whatever it might be it can be really just some, something simple as just just listening to a client 
and uh, you're engaging with them and then identifying that there is a potential problem or a potential issue that needs to be resolved and that they can get advice on that. And then and then being able to find someone within the organization or outside of the organization that can provide that kind of advice. And, um, you know, I, I think as Chris was saying, you know, <clears throat> nowadays with the technology that we've got available to us, we can produce things like management accounts really quickly in comparison, you know, in, in a matter of hours and compared compared to say a few days that, that might have taken us sort of five, 10, 15, years ago and and the fundamental difference then is that if you're if your sort of manual tasks are taking less time that that should in theory give you more time to spend you know spending time with clients and 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 talking to them um and that, and that's then where you need to be able to develop those human skills you need to be able to have curiosity about clients have curiosity about the data and the information you're being provided you need to um you know you need to be able to engage on a level that 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 works with people with multiple different types of personalities and backgrounds and everything else, because not every, you know, not every, um, you know, successful entrepreneur comes from Eton or comes from, you know, gets kicked out of school at 15 or whatever the stories are that you hear. Um, and, and so that, that's the biggest challenge. That's the most fun part about the job is, is, is actually being able to deal with, with, with different people at different levels. And I think the technology enables you to, to sort of get the compliance stuff done a lot more quickly so you can actually have more touch points with the clients you know we can we can now produce management accounts or, or whatever and have monthly meetings with client, clients talk about the advisory sort of side business plans we can do a lot more of that work because the compliance stuff is sorted and done a lot quicker so that, and that, like john says that is the more fun part and the client interactions and you know trying to understand getting really under the skin of the business trying to understand stuff and, and how we can support them so so the tech is a means to to an end. It helps you to to just go back to the basics, really, to get all that kind of stuff done, so you can have the really important stuff. So I think you know the, the tech is one part of it, but I think you know the robots will never take all our jobs because the human interaction element is is the vital bit. It's a really important bit, and you know we talk about soft skills, and I hate that word because I think actually they're essential skills. You know the communication, the challenging, the how we work with teams, uh, and I think you know technology will. You know, we'll never be able to replace that because it's that, that human element and you know mm. relationships you have with people. The text just enables you to do that quicker or have more meaningful conversations with people. So, yeah, it's 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 certainly an interesting one, but I, I think yeah, the tech just has to be a part of that. I, th I think the only the only additional sort of challenge that you get as a consequence of the technology right is that you you do require additional skills in an organization and i think certainly as your size of your organization scales as well that the requirement for those different kind of skills accelerates so you know, we talked about the use you know the fact that we use um you know data analytics on our audit department so you know five years ago that would never have been something that we would even have considered and um, you know now we have a you know we have a team of data analysts that work within our audit department. They're not they're not accountants. They're not auditors. They're not they're not trained. Uh, you know, haven't done any exams in accountancy. They may have done accountancy at degree level or something similar, but but actually their their key skills are around data analysis and data interpretation. Um, and you know, I guess in the same way that a large organisation would have an IT department that maybe historically was just a sort of you know maintaining team in terms of you know they kept the servers running and kept your laptop and your phone working and things like that now we need increased you know skills in in different areas you know whether that's um you know things like developer skills to to be able to connect some of these systems together using using api calls uh whether that's uh, skills around robotic process automation whether that's skills around things like power bi and being able to build dashboards with all of these various data sets that we've got available to us and so those, those are the kind of the the new skills that we're now seeing come into firms and again you, you can see that from the very top and it, it does definitely trickle down so um you know if you kind of look at what the big four are doing you know they've got they've got people with skills around ai which we don't have uh you know as a firm but but i'm sure maybe in five years time we possibly will do um you know and other and you know skills around blockchain and you know investments into the metaverse and things you know all of that's yet to come for us and i guess for, for chris probably a couple of years after us maybe but um you know that that will that will all come come in time i was reading um an article recently about um an icaw entry level exam and some uh i think it was um some it, somebody had programmed the exam into software. Uh, I think it was an assurance exam and it was a multiple choice exam. The um, the computer got 
Yeah, pretty, yeah, pretty, Stuart, Stuart pretty, Carter clo used pretty to. close to the pass mark, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to be fair, that's better than some of our trainees sometimes. So, well, yeah. to, to be fair, it's better than some of my students too. So, <laughs> It was it was pretty impressive, I thought, um, and really interesting. But it might mean that there are implications for how we go about training um, the finance professionals of the future. You know, yeah. a, a shift in emphasis, perhaps more. To, and certainly in our degree programs, we have really taken on board the requirement to um, train for softer skills you know to um, a, a much bigger proportion of the overall degree content um you know and really thinking about you know the skills like communication and commercial acumen and strategic thinking and because the technical skill i mean i i still think technical skills are very important but it might define how you it might depend how you define technical skills, you know, understanding debits and credits, maybe not, but using kind of tools for strategic analysis or understanding what your toolkit is, that could be a technical skill too. And I, I think that those are still important, but I think they're important because they give you expert power and they also give you confidence to act as a finance professional and not just be the same as every other business professional they are something that distinguishes us with a unique set of skills um but i think there is a change in emphasis in terms of we also need to be kind of teaching and thinking about those other skills as well and recognizing yeah. that that there is maybe a change in the way that people learn as a consequence of technology um i also read an article recently about the, the impact of the metaverse and it was talking about um, it was envisioning you know, engaging with people in a, in a really different way. So can you imagine in the far, far future, if an architect can take you into a building in, in kind of uh, using VR technology, could you take somebody into their management accounts? You know, the death of PowerPoint, could they, could they, could you send like a virtual avatar into a kind of space where you could really like, take them into their accounts and have them kind of visually understand and be part of the the, the the data visualization and suddenly that becomes very star trek and very exciting doesn't it <laughs> i, I can really visualize that happening all, the is all sat around the sort of table at the meeting with all the sort of goggles on just... yeah that's right i can just i can see it and and for training and teaching you know you could send a digital twin into a real or well a virtual real audit or uh, into a business scenario and have them kind of properly play it out and it would be much more engaging and immersive wouldn't it mm. I don't, and i think i think that's one of the opportunities for education in terms of you know one of the one of the challenges that we have when we bring in trainees at every level, whether they're school leavers or college or graduates, you know, is that, that what they massively lack is some real world experience. You know, and we, we spend quite a long time, to be honest, knocking the hard edges off them because what they learn is very hypothetical and it's all very kind of like exam hypothetical in terms of it's it's something that, you know, that, that very rarely happens in the real world. Um, and so, yeah, there is there is a huge opportunity there to, to, to really like knuckle down in terms of like making that training much more relevant. Um, and, you know, I, I guess, you know, to your point in terms of like what sort of basic skills do 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 you know, um, you know, finance people of the future need. Well, you know, I, I, I before this call, we, we did some prep and we were talking about, you know, like my feeling is like, if you, if you drive a car, right, you, most people who drive a car don't understand how the engine works. And if you've got an electric car and you open up the bonnet, actually that's a space for putting more bags in. Cause like, all you know, there is no engine, right. The engine, you know, the batteries are just underneath. And, and so, you know, do we need to understand debits and credits anymore as, as accountants? I mean, do we need to understand sort of that theory? I, I think that the jury's out a little bit on that in terms of what's going on. And, and then in terms of that point that you made, Kate, about that, the about Stuart, who ran that test on the ICW assurance paper, um, you know, uh, assurance is an area where, where accountants get hung up and get hung out to dry all the time because what happens is they're, they're you know they're humans right and we're, we're very subjective individuals we can't stay objective particularly easily and so we get into trouble all the time with the regulators
regulators because we 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 make choices and we have you know uh, and, we, and we 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 make opinions with with maybe not the right kind of evidence and that's an area where something like AI could potentially help you know resolve those problems around subjectivity and and a lack of objectivity in our in our space so that, so there's definitely there's definitely opportunities and and I mean going back to the metaverse you know one of my one of my friends runs probably the the, the most pre, pre, um, preeminent um uh crypto advisory firms in the uk and actually most of his client meetings are held on the metaverse so pe people are already really? doing that wow. at the very very cutting edge you know in our space uh i, I think i think we're a little way off that um but um <laughs> you know but but that that is that is where things are going i think what, just to sort of jump in and pick up on, on something you mentioned before kate i think one of the things that's very difficult technology to, to kind of do is is you mentioned commercial acumen and that's one thing that we're we're really kind of key and, and passionate about is kind of you know not just processing or, or 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 sort of you know looking at stuff, but it's kind of you know the commercial side is getting a really wide, broad range of absolutely everything, pulling everything from all sorts of different angles, and, and I think that's a that's something which is really difficult for technology to kind of it, it's what you know it's what it's it's even difficult to describe what commercial acumen it is, is. yeah, it is it, it, it is. You know, kind of and it's really difficult for early career professionals too, isn't it? To, yeah. You know, that, that's just a really get that. Because, you know, I think if, you know, I, I mean, I've had to learn it because, you know, I came from a, a technical background. I love the technical. I was sort of, um, I worked for KPMG for eight years in corporate tax. It was really technical. And you very much sort of, you know, pigeonholed and, and sort of you've got one thing to look at. But I think when you, when you have your own business, that does widen your mindset and you do have to start thinking about other aspects, how this thing will impact on this and that and, and you know, what's the best thing to do. And I think that is, is, is a really important thing in business to help clients with or other businesses. But how on earth do you do that from a technological point of view? I think that's a, that's a very difficult, <laughs> probably a whole other sort of topic, topic to discuss. But um, so I think that that's definitely a challenge, but you know, something really vital for, for, for you know um, graduate career professionals to kind of yeah to think about really it is maybe it's coming there's something that john said interested me as well which was about the fact that accountants are humans and therefore we don't always make fully objective decisions but i mean we also have to recognize don't we that ai itself can have bias mm, um, mm. so it's something that you know we shouldn't we shouldn't just wholly rely on the computer to be fully objective. You know, so for example, if you were programming in um, and using AI to look through a series of CVs and you told it to select candidates who had been successful in your organization before, and if it just so happened that the type of people who were successful in your organization before were predominantly kind of white males, then you, you would perpetuate that potential bias, wouldn't you? Agree, so, and, and that, that's always a risk with technology. Is that you know we we see it we see it around process automation as well, and you know we've got this sort of phrase in accountancy like garbage in, garbage out. Yeah, and, and, yeah. You know the the risk with automation is, is that um, you know if you've got an employee who who follows the same process and that process is wrong, um, you know they they can probably what enter. I don't know let's let's be generous and say they can put like 300 invoices onto an account system in a day well you get a, you get a robot to do that they could probably do 300,000 in a day uh if not more and so you you, you can suddenly see that if you've got a if you've got a bad process and 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 and, and you implemented technology in a bad way that you can exacerbate the problems so much more you know and 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 that that's one of the big challenges and and that's you know that's why I was saying you know when we when we do a lot of stuff around our our technology implementations we're talking about like process uh, systems reviews we're talking about education and training for our staff in terms of you know the use of it and part of that is around you know um you know having a sort of a, 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 a fall over or a fail back in terms of just making sure that you know we we follow up and review that quite often what a lot of businesses and a lot of finance uh professionals do in their in their organizations is they'll they'll see a new shiny piece of technology they'll drop it into their business they'll let it run and then it causes havoc and they don't realize until they come to that month end set of accounts or whatever the, you know whatever the stopping point is um and and actually you know what you know what you need to make sure you do with any piece of technology is that it's monitored carefully and that you you know you monitor the success or the failures of that and, and learn learn you know learn from those experiences 
Yeah. Was it Hammer who said, don't automate, obliterate? <laughs> <laughs> I quite like that. Um, so I think we've seen, haven't we, that there's lots of impacts of uh, adopting technology on work processes, on employees, maybe even actually on um, business models themselves. You know, perhaps we have to stop just thinking about technology as something that enables business, but actually it could develop strategies itself. You know, really, we could think big, couldn't we? Um, what we didn't touch, I'm just a bit conscious of time because I want to open the floor up to some questions if our audience have any. But um, our remit was our, was to talk about a shift to digital, will it cost jobs or save the planet? So we should probably just think about the benefits of technology in terms of sustainability as well. Do you see any in your businesses? Yeah, I, I mean, there, there are there are massive there are massive benefits of technology, you know, in terms of sustainability. I mean, I, I guess in the in the very very simplest form, right, is that you are gone are the days I think when <clears throat> certainly most accountancy practices are you know, forest destroyers because we used to spend a lot of time printing things out, scribbling on them with pen, handing them around the office for someone to deal with, and then you kind of go through that that cycle of you know just just constantly like reprinting sets of accounts or letters or whatever it might be so so at its very basic level that then then we're you know we're doing something positive around that but but i mean you know in terms of you know talking about the what you know wider technology i mean you know there's so much technology that's available for use in in real estate whether that's in offices or in, in your homes in terms of you know managing energy having things like the lights going on and off when you're in an office and all sorts of other things so there, there are huge opportunities um to do that there are tax incentives for doing that i mean chris will enjoy me mentioning that um and um um you know th th those are things that that firms and businesses should should absolutely embrace you know because um you know sustainability is something that customers uh, are looking for with most of the businesses that they interact with but also you know in its purest sense it has a cost saving impact you know so so for for anyone that you know, is is wanting to uh, increase the bottom line or improve their cash flow or whatever and if you can if you can um aim for a sustainability goal ultimately you'll you'll probably save money as well in the, in, in the long term yeah, yeah I, sorry Kate. i was just going to say chris you had some good stories about in our pre-meeting about um yeah. CO2 emissions and kind of uh, uh, yeah well we've kind experience. of experience you know we're only a small firm but we're kind of you know we're really keen to kind of go on the net zero journey and, and see what we can do as a business and we've we've a um, couple of things we've, we've obviously we start the process with B Corp status just purely from kind of we want to know where we're falling short what we can do better um, so we started that process and. Um, but, but as part of the net zero, we, we joined forces with Ecology, which I think most people have, have heard of now, um, where they plant trees and do all sorts of projects, and it's part of some carbon offsetting. And we thought, well, you know, we hardly do. We, you know, we have a, we have a few clients who perhaps drive to, not in the region, you know, we do most calls on Zoom, you know, we're paperless, you know, what, what you know, you know, our carbon's going to be quite low, really. Um, and, and Ecology recently um, have got this beta where you can connect it to, to zero. So we do all our accounting, our own accounting stuff on zero. So we connect it to, it, it pulls up across all the supplies. You know, there's a few questions about energy and, and travel and um, that sort of thing. But it connects to your suppliers. And, and I'm not quite sure how it works. I mean, John will probably know <laughs> the detail, all this kind of stuff. But we it, just it assume John knows everything. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, and it sort of spits out this answer in terms of what your CO2 emissions are. And it, and, and it was, I can't remember what, what the number was, um, and we're still in the process of adding more, more of our supplies to connect on. But what it showed me was, actually, it's, it's our whole supply chain. So because we use all these multiple apps, multiple systems, those companies which supply the apps and the software have their own CO2 and carbon um, footprint. And, and because we're using them, obviously that has an impact, and, and that that grows, you know, the potential to grow there. So it just got me thinking, a sort of bit wider on this. It's not necessarily what we do, but who else we use in, in our process to deliver our services, and um, that that can have you know a real impact. So you know that's that's the sort of journey we're going on at the moment, um, and, and just sort of wide this out as well. I think you know I think a lot of you know 
potential new clients and, and, and even potential new employees are also looking at you know what, what's the company, what's the business doing in terms of sustainability and 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 you know, sort of with all the climate challenges we've got, what, what's the business doing? Is it committed to doing anything? And I think that's becoming more and more key and apparent. But I think the technology is you know, can help us to do that, but we've still got to do the journey ourselves and be the ones to say, yeah, do you know what, we're going to make a pledge, we're going to do something about this, but the technology will, will help us to some degree to get there, but we're still going to be mindful that the technology itself has an impact on this sustainability. So It's like change, yeah. I don't know what the answer, yeah. what the answer is yet, but it, it's just, you know, it's just an interesting sort of concept and um, I, I, I think the, the most interesting thing, right, we're talking about sort of technology and sustainability. So there's lots of <clears throat> there's lots of there's lots of great technology that, that helps in terms of achieving sustainability goals. You know, the move to electric cars, for example, although I, you know, some some might question how sustainable those are, you know, the LED lighting and all that kind of stuff. Actually, the biggest challenge that, that I think most businesses have, and you know, Chris mentioned ecology, which is you know a really great app for, for helping in this, but there's not there's not great technology out there for helping businesses to identify what their potential you know sustainability impacts are in terms of whether that's measure, measuring CO2, measuring measuring things in your supply chain and other bits and pieces um you know and there's a huge opportunity there for 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 technology to really really uh you know provide you know some assistance in that because you know we we deal with some large clients who already have esg reporting requirements uh you know and what we're having to do with them where they've got those requirements is is bringing consultants who basically go through a fairly manual process of you know fairly dull things like looking at the gas and electricity bills and trying to work out how how much their their employees are traveling around and whether they travel by train or in a car or on a plane and and then you know making some some informed um you know um you know some some informed sort of estimates and decisions on that so so there's there there aren't there aren't great pieces of technology at the moment that really help you to kind of monitor the, the wider impact of a business and and, and that's that's an area where uh there, there must be some solutions that will come down the track well chris is the early adopter of um you know <laughs> I've so, said that now. You can hold me to that. <laughs> I really am, Chris. I'm expecting you to launch that app now in, <laughs> within the next ten days. <laughs> mm. We've got a couple of questions actually from our um, audience, which is great. The first one uh, is: What advice would we give to graduates joining the finance profession to prepare for the changed ways of working? Um, so I, I think I love the word that John used earlier, which was curious. It's like one of my favorite words. I think that if we can stay curious and be lifelong learners, then that's really got to help, hasn't it? Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, for me, for me, you know, uh, your 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 academic achievements are somewhat irrelevant if you're not if you're not curious. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm really sorry to say that, but, but um, you know, no, that, I mean, I think that's absolutely true. That's the, my favorite word is curiosity. So. Yeah. Um, as a, you know, as, as a business owner, what, what I don't want is to give an employee, you know, one of the members of the team, here's a task, do the task, to come back and go, yeah, it's done. I want them to come back and go, I've done a book, but I've noticed this, or why are we doing that, or what's this about? You know, I want to be challenged. You know, I don't have all the answers, you know, I need, I need, that's why I need a team to help us do it. So I think not being afraid to challenge things, even if it's been done for, 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 for years, you know, I, I like someone to challenge things, you know, and, and the team have done that. And that's why we're in a different place now, because we've had people who challenged us and, well, why are we doing this? Should we not be doing this instead? And it's like, yeah, yeah, right. yeah go and do it. You know, that's, that's yours. Run with it now. So I think... I think that that mindset is 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 really key. I think you know, yeah. you know sort of tech, you know, we don't employ people on technical ability. You know, main thing is is what's their attitude like? Are, you know, are they curious? Are they commercial? You know, can they think a little bit differently? Are they not afraid to sort of challenge these things? Um, you know, that's be the, open to change, maybe. Ability. Yeah, ad adaptability is yeah. hugely adaptability. hugely important, especially when we were talking about the fact that the pace of change when it comes to technology and business is so is so fast now. You know, I think an ability to be able to adapt and and to find your own way because I think increasingly. 
Um, again, you know, contrasting probably mine and Chris's experiences, you know, of, of sort of decades ago is that, you know, whenever you used to have a new piece of technology brought into practice, you probably spent like three weeks going through training to learn how it worked. Nowadays, you know, things are much more intuitive and they should be like that, you know, in terms of, you know, we should be able to pick up new pieces of technology straight away. Um, and, and, and it should, you should find it as, as an adaptable, adaptable individual, it should be much more easy to kind of pick up things and, and, you know, as, as, you know, particularly as we move to cloud products. So SaaS products are constantly being updated, you know, gone are the days again, where we would have like an update once a year and if something would fundamentally change, like the software that Chris and I are using in the day-to-day -day lives can be updated, you know, almost daily in some instances with new, new features, new bits and pieces being added. And so you've got to be constantly on top of that, um, you know, and, and be able to sort of make the best use of those new, new features as they come to you to, to, to get the best out of your, your job. I think, and I think just be curious yeah. enough to Google sometimes because you can find answers to almost yeah. everything. You know, every Excel problem I've ever had, I can find an answer on Google. Um, <laughs> and, you know, same for, you know, Power BI or, you know, there's so much out there, isn't there? Um, but how do you two stay on top of, I mean, Chris, we talked about the fact that you were really kind of forward thinking and um, ahead of the curve a little bit in terms of kind of changing to a, being a, a digital practice. Um, I guess one of the pieces of advice I'd like to give is that they, people should try and stay on top of the, the, the you know, what's out there, what's happening. Um, it's been, yeah, again, it's been. How, how do you do I'm, that? Yeah, well, it, to be honest, it does. I mean, I've got the team, I've got the time now. So I probably 90% of my time is business development, looking for the opportunities, you know, trying to grow the business. The team handles all the, the sort of day to day work. So, you know, I've, I've sort of, manufactured my position so I can do that now but at, right at the start of it I just I, I just connected with all the sort of trendsetters the pace setters on LinkedIn I just felt that's how I started I just followed everyone thought yeah. oh they're doing something really I've not heard about that you know then I'd go and get their books from Amazon read read it or you know what exactly yeah. what they're doing think right okay well that's working for them so I'll, I'll take what the bit I like from that so yeah it's, it's like join the community isn't it yeah, join the community and, and, and listen you know, and we start getting the feel for kind of what's out there What's you know? What's just a kind of bit of a flash in the pan, or what's some, you know, or what's really going to hit the ground running? So you know, it's just connecting, having a community, connecting with the people, and just just absorbing as much as possible. I mean, I you know, it's my, it's not my job, but it's kind of what I enjoy doing. I enjoy kind of growing and developing and taking. I enjoy. I love a challenge, and I get bored now really easily doing the same thing. So I think you know, having that mindset does does definitely help. So you think you're right. You know, what's out there? What can we do next? And to, you know, I, you know, there's there's still things obviously you're gonna miss, but that, that's you know, that's just you can't do everything, but um just finding the important stuff. Um, yep, it's really good advice. And you know, as John illustrated, um kind of keep in touch with your network as well, because you've got a friend who knows about the metaverse. I just, so follow, yeah, that's... I just follow John on LinkedIn and see what he posts about. And everyone should follow John, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, there um, is another question as well, which is about the do the panel think that the risks of using AI um, outweigh the benefits to the risks in terms of data protection, bias? Are the, do the risks outweigh the benefits? Um, I, I mean, my, my my personal view on this is that that no, they don't. And I mean, you know, at the moment, you know, all, all with all of the exciting talk about things like chat GPT, for example, and obviously that's got an issue for, for people like yourself, Kate. And scaring me, yeah. Whether whether <laughs> students are just going to use that to write all of their, uh, you know, all of their you know, theses. Or, or whether like lecturers are going to use it to just write yeah. all of their, all yeah, of their yeah. classes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I guess... I guess, you know, at the moment, all of the talk about AI at the moment is that we're still talking about what is essentially called weak AI. So uh, uh, although, um, uh, you know, although we talk about it as artificial intelligence, essentially all it, all it is doing is <clears throat> is doing what you suggested before, Kay, which is it's basically just Googling stuff, right? And it's just, just but it's just being able to do it <laughs> on mass better. At, at, yeah. a, at a greater scale. It's, it's doing it quicker. It's going to do it faster, uh, more effectively. Um, and then it's been able to aggregate that and, and interpret that data. So, <clears throat> so AI at the moment is not not really a significant danger. And and the reality is, in terms of like you know whether there's a danger for job roles and a danger in terms of like ethics and stuff, is that um, you know AI is not going to replace anybody's job, but but somebody using AI is going to replace somebody's job. Um, you know what you might find is automation 
might might replace somebody's job so things like purchase ledger clerks i think your days are doomed if there's anyone who's a purchase ledger clerk on the call um if you're a bookkeeper you know the role that a bookkeeper is going to do is going to have to change and adapt you know and, and things around like credit control quite a lot of things like that are going to are going to be be impacted by levels of automa automation and digitization in business but um but no i mean um we're not quite at the um you know uh, sarah connor kind of level of, of having to sort of like get the big shotgun out and start shooting machines and stuff at the moment but uh, you know that may happen but but at the moment ai in terms of its development is, is still probably 10 years off being being remotely um uh, sort of unmanageable if you like and self-aware so that that's where the big challenges probably come i'm glad you said 10 years because i'm 54 so that just about takes me to <laughs> The previous retirement age. <laughs> so that that's good. As long as it's ten years, that's fine for me. Um, um, another question is that we all touched on adaptability, but a lot of people struggle with that and um, aren't really open to new ways of working. So how could we combat that mindset? Um, and that's the difficult one, isn't it? It is. Yeah, I think you know. It, it, it is a mindset, and I think, you know, when, when you change your mindset, you know, it's not something you can do overnight. You've just got to start start small. Um, I, and I think, um, it, 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 you know, none of us really like change, do we? You know, if we're being honest, you know, we, we get comfortable in a routine, you know, we call it the comfort zone and all the rest of it. But when, when you do, and, and I hate sort of using these sort of phrases again because, you know, they get used quite a lot, don't they? But, you know, I, I've personally found this that you do, you know, you push yourself so it becomes a little bit uncomfortable, but then that then becomes comfortable. So you're not getting out of your comfort zone, you're just expanding it. Um, you know, it's like it's like anything, isn't it? Learning a new language or a new skill. At first, it's really difficult, it's hard, it's not it's not pleasant. But you know, when you look back and reflect on where you've come from, you actually, you know, you've actually come a long way. Um, and I think it's the same with, with that kind of mindset is it's you, you just got to you know i think having that challenging open to to to, to learn new things is going to be difficult at first but i think you've just got to keep something you're just going to keep working on and i think you know reading i mean i you know i read a lot of business books and they're really motivating and that keeps me kind of going thinking yeah you know it gets it gets me excited and sort of empowered to do stuff so that that's i think you've got to find something that motivate you to do it or perhaps ask what why are you struggling you know what's the reason what's the fear behind it Thing, but not, you know, not necessarily put, put yourself right out there. You can just, oh, just start to just start to expand it a little bit, and that's where the that's where the fun happens. Is you know, if, if you stay within this little comfort bubble, it's nice, but you'll never experience all these other great things that are out there and ways of working. And, and you know, and we're all more adaptable than we think, aren't we? Because yeah, you know, yeah. just reflecting back to the Absolutely. the pandemic and what John said about you know, I had had Skype on my desk for probably two years before. The pandemic came and then and it really i only saw that as a tool that fancy people used uh, but, but now i, I kind of can't live without it so or without its well, place that's, but, a, that's a prime example isn't it yeah yeah you know, it really I suppose, is i suppose the difference was we were forced to use that so we all had to but i suppose if we're not forced to do something that's when it's difficult but i think you need you know you need the carrot rather than the stick and i think you need to you need to have a good motivation, good reason to want to do it. And, you know, I, I know it's, I've said it, but, you know, reading books about or finding other people who've done it, how they've done it really has helped me to do it. You know. I think businesses can help as well by just providing kind of spaces for talking about technology, for showing other people how you've made a change in your work using technology and what the kind of benefits have been and, and just kind of making it feel a bit safer. For employees yeah. are just encouraging them to make small changes yeah and I think um, you know, not not being afraid to, to make mistakes and you know i think that's that's the key thing is when someone makes you know try something and um, it doesn't work they should be rewarded for that because they're trying mm -hmm. to you you know we all make mistakes and that that's how i think everyone thinks business leaders have, have, have got things nailed we haven't we're still feeling that way we, with a lot of things you know we still kind of you know we've got plans we've got you know we know where we want to go but it's how do we get there and we still make loads of mistakes along the way and don't do things correctly because we're all kind of feeling that way and you have to do things in your own way so you know it's a journey you have to go on yourself but i think having that supportive environment like you like you said kate can really help people you know 
safe environment where people can feel that they can do that without the fear of kind of being, you know, hit over the head if something does go wrong or doesn't quite work out. Even the old people. <laughs> and I, I think, I think, I think, as Chris sort of said, the messaging comes from the top, um, and um, you, we, we are all creatures of habit. And and uh, I mean, I, I I read a really good book last year, which is called The Power of Habit by by Charles uh, Duhigg. Uh, that that's a really good book about this sort of psychology about how we do sort of get into habits and and why we do it. And it's basically because we're lazy. So you know, when, <laughs> when we learn something new, it's really hard. And so we try and make it as easy as possible, as quickly as possible, because then our brain can effectively just switch off. Um, yeah. And and so, you know, adaptability and change is, is a massive requirement in our workforce at the moment. The messaging comes from the top. And then also there has to be a level of reassurance is that, you know, the, the those changes that we're making are positive changes in terms of, you know, they will benefit the employees, not just the business. I think that's very important to get that message across. So I think it's nearly two o'clock and I just wanted to say I really enjoyed talking to you both about uh, the shift to digital. Um, I think I've learned a lot. And um, I really hope that our listeners have feel the same way. Um, yeah, what a great experience. Thanks. Thank you very much for joining me on the panel. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Kate. Enjoy. Thanks, Kate.